Uh, uh, uh. Boy, that's some horrible stuff. <coughs> this, this, this is um, you know, this is just a um. Basically, <coughs> an example of how uh, stuff can go real bad for us real quick because they've done it before. And I don't hear anybody talking about ways that we should be defending ourselves. Um, I don't even hear anybody talking um, uh, uh, like... This has happened before. It's like y'all, we're so immune to uh, trauma that, um, you know, we, we can't, we don't have a great response and, and, and call, you know, we don't have a, um, a memory bank where some of this stuff in our history is so... A new report from the Daily Beast indicates uh, that Herschel our, Walker not uh, that is so ingrained in our thinking that we would have always been ready. See, because if you always ready, you don't have to get ready. Right? So, but if you in a situation where you always running or you always um being surprised, then you know you haven't learned anything collectively and you haven't put anything in place to protect your women and children. Negro workmen, again, had been fired in, uh, in flames past a weird, past a weird glare over the sea. Those who still possessed ammunition fired into charred remains of the houses and others applied the torch to other houses. With the coming of night and miles rose to greater excesses, the augmented military forces were able Saturday to control the rioters. And aside from delusionatory outbreaks of minor nature, there was no violence. So Y'all got to remember these uh, uh, the Neanderthal in them in, uh, allows them to have this thirst for blood that is extremely unhealthy, uh, but it is satisfying to them. They love bloodshed. I mean, and if you look at the history of, uh, it, you know, it's not like tribal wars. They actually, actually went after, you know, just... Uh, a barbaric way of living, and I'm saying, in, in all fairness to them, it is the Neanderthal gene that they carry that allows them to have such a thirst for blood. That's why the Quran called them the Great Blood Shutter, the Great Blood Shutter, uh, because they love it. They love it. Oh. Uh, the day was marked by a search of ruins of the fire as, as it swept the area. 28 bodies of Negroes, one child had been found when darkness halted the search. By nightfall, it was estimated that nearly 4,000 Negroes had fled the city, most of them crossing uh, the city of St. Louis where they were sheltered and fed. There were several small fires during the night, but most of there were believed to have started from the smoldering members, embers of the Monday night arson. Almost hourly during the night, troops were arriving from all parts of Illinois. Ten additional companies have been ordered out by Governor Loudon before his departure from Springfield. In one of the sections occupied in part by Negro residents, a powerful Negro stood in the doorway of his home, his hand in his pockets, and carefully scanned every passing by and machine. It was believed that he was armed and preferred to sell his life dearly if any mob approached. A newspaper writer in graphic account 
of the writing said, For an hour and a half that evening, I saw the massacre of helpless Negroes at Broadway and 4th Street in downtown East St. Louis, where a black skin was a deaf one. I saw a man, so, so I just want y'all to know that this is hard tradition to break for uh, white police officers for who, which derived from the slave catchers and the, you know, uh, uh, night patrolling patrollers, the paddy, paddy rollers, that there's a thirst that they were allowed to get away with by killing us and burning us. They were able to quench their desire for blood thirst, and we became the proverbial other where it's okay to do harm to us. And because not only we can take it, uh, medical apartheid showed them, of course, when, you know, we're not human. So any desperation, anxiety uh, that you may have, you can take your desires out on the Negro. You can take all your frustration out on the Negro. And it still happens to this day. I saw man after man with hands raised, pleading for his life, surrounded by groups of men who had never seen men, who, surrounded by groups of men, men who had never seen him before and knew nothing about him except that he was black and saw them administer a historic sentence of intolerance, death by stoning. I saw one of these men almost dead from a savage shower of stones, hang with the clothesline, and when it broke, hang with the rope which held. Within a few paces of the pole from which he was suspended, four other Negroes lay dead or dying, another having removed dead a short time before. I saw the pockets of two of these Negroes search without the findings of any weapons, and I saw these men, covered with blood and half conscious, raised himself on his elbow and took and looked feebly about when a young man standing directly behind him lifted a flat stone with both hands and hurled it upon his neck. This much this young man was much better dressed than most of the others, and he walked away unmolested. I saw Negro women begging for mercy and pleading that they had harmed no one set upon by white women of the Bay Short who laughed and answered uh, the coarse sallies of men as they beat the Negroes' faces and breasts with their fists, stones, and sticks. I saw one of these furies fleeing herself at a militia man who was trying to protect the Negro and wrestled with him for his bayonet gun while other women attached the refugee, attacked the refugee. Oh, man. It's crazy. What I saw in the 90 minutes between 6.30 and the lure coming upon darkness was but one local scene of drama of death. I am satisfied that in spirit and method, it typified the whole. I cannot somehow speak of what I saw as mob violence. It was not my idea of a mob. The East St. Louis affair, as I saw it, was a manhunt conducted on a sporting basis, though with anything but fair pay, which is the principle of sport, fair play. I'm sorry, the, with anything but fair play, which is the, the basic principle of the sport, of sport. The East St. Louis men took no chances except a chance from stray shots, which every spectator of their acts took. They went into, into small groups. There was little leadership, and there was a horribly cool deliberateness 
and a spirit of fun about it. I cannot allow even the doubtful excuse of drink. No man whom I saw showed the effects of liquor. It was no crowd of it was no crowd of hot headed youths. The young men were in greater number, but there were a middle aged group no less active in the task of destroying every black life that was discoverable. When I got off a state streetcar on Broadway at 6.30, a fire apparatus was on its way to the blaze near the 5th Street, south from Broadway. A moment's survey showed why this fire had been set and what it had been to accomplish. The shreds of rear of Negroes' houses which themselves in the street had been ignited to drive out the Negro occupants and the slayers were waiting for them to come out. It was stay in or be roasted or come out and be slaughtered. A moment before I arrived, one Negro had taken the desperate chance of coming out and the rattle of revolver shots, which I heard as I approached the corner, was followed by the cry of, I've got him. And they had. He lay on the pavement, a bullet wound in his head and his skull bare in two places. At every moment of pain, which showed that life remained, there came terrific kick in the jaw or the nose or crashing stone from one of the men who stood over him. At the corner of a, of a few steps away, there was a sergeant and several guardsmen. The sergeant approached the ring of men around the prostrate Negro. This man is done for, he said. You better get him away from here. No one made a move to lift the blood-covered form, and the sergeant walked away. By that time, the fire and the fire eye the the fire the rear of the Negro homes had grown much hotter, and the men were standing all in the narrow spaces through which the Negroes might come to the street. There was talk of a Negro in on the the houses who had a Winchester, and the opinion was expressed that he had no ammunition left though. But no one went too near, and the fire was dependent to drive him out. The firemen were at work on Broadway, some distant east, but the flames immediately in the rear of the Negro houses buried without hindrance. A half block to the south, there was a hue and a cry at a railroad crossing, and infusible of shots was heard. More militia men than I seen anywhere else go up to that time were standing on a platform and near a string of freight cars and trying to keep back men who had started to pursue Negroes along the track. As I turned back towards Broadway, there was a shot at the alley and the Negro ran out, apparently hoping to find protection. He paid no attention to the missiles thrown from behind, none of which had hurt him much, but he was stopped in the middle of the street by a smashing blow to the jaw struck by a man whom he did not see. Don't do that, he appealed. I haven't hurt nobody. The answer was the blow from one side of pieces of curb stone and from the other side, a push that sent him into the brick pavement. He didn't rise again. And the battering and kicking of his skull continued until he lay still, his blood flowing halfway across the street. Before he had been booted to the opposite curb, another Negro appeared. I did not see any revolver shots fired at these men. Bullets ammunition were saved for use at long range, and it was the last Negro I have mentioned who was apparently finished by the stone hurled upon his neck by the noticeably well-dressed man. The butchering of the fire-trapped Negroes went on so rapidly that 
When I walked back to the alley a few minutes later, one was lying dead in the alley on the west side of 4th Street and another was laying on the east side. And now women began to appear. One frightened black girl, probably about 20 years old, got as far as Broadway with no worse treatment than jeers and thrusts. The claims for in indemnities expected to be placed against the city of East St. Louis as a result of the race wires are anticipated as a heavy burden upon the already stringent finances of the city. The bonded indebtedness of East St. Louis is $750,000, which is supplemented by a liability of $100,000 in judgments against the city, which are unpaid. In addition to this, the Treasury is approximately $150,000 behind in the payment of its current expenses for the meeting of which is the coming year taxes are anticipated. The damage done by the rioters has been estimated at 700000 in addition to the deaths for which is claimed in the city is liable. Attorney Daniel McGlynn Saturday night declared that there is no question as to the liability of the city in the view of the face that all insurance policies are automatically voided in cases of damage resulting from mob violence. Mob violence is a problem. It was a problem and it still is. May my ancestors rest in peace for the brutal violations that was done against a brown black bodies may my people today keep their eyes on and heads on the swivel because if we don't figure out a way to protect ourselves this day is right here again and it is not a sin to protect yourself it is not a violent act to want to protect yourself that's the first law of nature, self-preservation. I feel bad and because this is the Holocaust of black people that not only do we forget and just don't want to want to bury it because it's so painful, but it's one that they remember and they can't wait to do it again. I want to know what y'all think about the East St. Louis massacre. So a lot of people want to know what happened in East St. Louis and why it is the way it is. That's a little bit history about East St. Louis. Okay, I'll see y'all in the next video. Leave your comments and your thoughts. I really appreciate it.